Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to Tuesday Social Studies. Okay, what you need for today's lesson. I emailed you the story Blood, Smoke, and Freedom, a true story of the American Revolution. Today we're going to read about a guy called Joseph Plum Martin. And if you notice in, this, in the title, it says, A True Story. That's because Joseph Martin was a real live person. So before we even get into the story, I wanted to show you some of the stuff that I found about Joseph Martin before we read. So here I am on history.com and I'm looking at the story of Joseph Plum Martin. So it gives me a little bit of information about his life as a soldier being under siege in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, road to Yorktown, and his life after the revolution. But what I found really interesting was when we got, when I found this page. So this page gave us just a little bit of information about him without going into too much detail. So I really found myself reading this paragraph that I found really interesting. So to sum it up for you, in June of 1776, Joseph Plum Martin was about 15 years old, and he decided to enlist in the military. So he wasn't sure how much he was going to like it, so he enlisted for only six months with the Connecticut State Troops, and he served in the Battle of Brooklyn. And that's what we're going to read about today when we read Blood, Smoke, and Freedom. The farm boy decided not to re-enlist after December of 1776. It doesn't say why he decided not to re-enlist, but he went home and had a winter at home, and I guess it was too dull for him because then he turned around the next year in 1777, and this time joined Washington's Continental Army and served for the duration of the war. So I thought it would be really fun today to read a little bit more about this guy, Joseph Plum Martin. Because we're reading I Survived the American Revolution, and because we're coming into the revolution in social studies, it's all tying together really nicely. So it's giving us the chance to really dive deep. So follow along with me as I read Blood, Smoke, and Freedom, a true story of the American Revolution. Before I even start reading, though, I want to just take a look at this beautiful picture. Can you imagine? It's nice that we're all on our computers right now because I wouldn't have been able to give you this beautiful copy sitting in front of you off one of the copy machines. This one's deep and rich and full of color and detail. And the great thing about being on your computer is you can find your little zoom in and zoom out tools and you can make your story bigger. You can really look at some of the detail. So I see this boy sitting here behind a tree. I see what looks like the American flag, but it looks a little different because it doesn't have 50 stars just yet. It has 13 for the 13 colonies. So I can use my context clues to decide that this is probably the Americans. These are the patriots. I see the battle on the other side going on, and I see all these guys in red. And I think I remember hearing something about how the British were called redcoats. So this must be the British army, and they're fighting against each other. I also notice a lot of fire detail around the corners. This is a cannon, and I see a lot of fire and smoke in the background, so we must be on a battlefield. And then I even notice this. Does this name look familiar to anybody? That's the author of our I Survived books. So this is very similar to what we're reading with Nate and Theo. So follow along with me as I read this. Boom, boom, boom. Cannon explosions shook the ground. Smoke filled the air and 15-year-old Joseph Plum Martin was lying in the dirt, trying to stay alive. It was August 27th, 1776. 
America and England were fighting the first big battle of the Revolutionary War in Brooklyn, New York. Just three months before, Joseph had begged his family to let him join the American army. Being a soldier would be a thrilling adventure, he was sure. Of course America would win. But now Joseph could see that the Americans were doomed. Hundreds of soldiers were dead. The cries and moans of wounded men rose up into the summer sky. It seemed Joseph had two choices. Surrender or die. Okay. Page two. The text is small, so zoom in. Sorry, guys. This is a little hard on my end. Okay, here we go. A New World. Joseph was born in 1760, when the United States wasn't yet a country. Much of America was wilderness. Lined up along the East Coast was a strip of land owned by England. This land was divided into the 13 separate areas known as colonies. Remember our map of the 13 colonies. Here, I'll bring one up for you. Okay, here's our map of the 13 colonies. Here's our New England colonies, our middle, and our southern. Everything outside the colonies was still Native American territory, and we did not own Florida yet. Florida was owned by the Spanish. So let's come back to our story. Lined up along the east coast was a strip of land owned by England. This land was divided into 13 separate areas known as colonies. Joseph lived with, lived with his grandparents in the colony of Connecticut. His great-great-grandfather had settled there in the mid-1600s. He journeyed to America on a creaking wooden ship 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean. Those early sea journeys lasted for several miserable months. Imagine being on a wooden open ship for months at a time trying to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Passengers suffered through ferocious storms, rotting food, biting rats, killer diseases, and many died before even reaching America. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't they just take an airplane? But this is 1776. There's no such thing as airplanes. There's no trains. There's no cars. The only way across a body of water would be a ship. And the ships looked very similar to this little one you see in the corner right here. Wooden, with big sails, no motors. That's why it took months and months to make it 3,000 miles. But that didn't stop thousands of people from heading to the New World, as America was called. They went because America promised a different kind of life. In England and across Europe, there were strict laws and old ideas controlling almost everything a person did. What prayers they would say, who they could marry, whether they were rich or poor, even who they could be friends with. These rules were like prison walls trapping people into unhappy lives. And no matter how hard the person worked, they couldn't break out. These rules and ideas didn't reach all the way to America. In America, a person could be freer there. No wonder people risked everything, even death, to get there. By the time Joseph was born, hundreds of thousands of people of European descent, meaning they came from Europe, lived in America. Trouble brewing. Not everyone thrived in the colonies. As more and more settlers arrived, hundreds of thousands of Native American people were killed. They tried, they died of diseases brought by the European settlers in fights over territory, of starvation after being forced from their homelands. We talked about all the terrible things that colonists did to the Native Americans. 
African people were dragged to America in chains and forced to become slaves for the settlers. This is where we left off in school before we had to go home. We were talking about the African slave trade. Remember, we talked about taking them across the Atlantic and bringing them to America. But for people like Joseph's family, who were white and free, life was better than almost anywhere else in the world. Joseph had been sent to live with his grandparents when he was seven. They were wealthy and showered him with love. Even as a kid, though, Joseph sensed that trouble was brewing. More and more Americans were angry with Mother England. They wanted more say over how laws were made in the colonies. They fumed, meaning they were really mad. They fumed at England's King George III. Why should he rule over America when he had never even been there? Some said the 13 colonies should tear away from England and become a new country. Like a storm that spins into a hurricane, anger between America and England turned into rage. And then on April 19, 1775, that rage exploded into war. Fighting broke out between American and British troops in and around the towns of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. And the American Revolution had begun. Seeds of Courage At first, the thought of fighting terrified Joseph. But soon, as he would later write in his memoir, Ooh, didn't we do memoir in class? I think that was one of those words we had a hard time with on our ELA test practice. And we thought, well, memoir sounds kind of like a memory. So it has to do with this person remembering something about their life. Ooh, I love when we come full circle with vocabulary words. Soon, he would later write in his memoir, The seeds of courage began to sprout. Hmm. Seeds of courage. So he's comparing courage to being like a plant. That it would sit in the ground and it would think and think and finally it would begin to grow. A little bud of an idea growing bigger and bigger. I'm on the top of the third column. He begged his grandparents to let him join in the new American army. And in June of 1776, they agreed. His grandmother packed his knapsack with clothes, cake, and cheese. His grandfather gave him a musket and a Bible. A musket is a kind of gun. It's kind of like the one you see in the very beginning chapters of I Survive. And Joseph sailed to New York City which had been turned into a massive American army camp. I was now what I had long wished to be, he wrote, a soldier. Except Joseph wasn't really a soldier, at least not yet. And neither were most of the nearly 20,000 men and teenage boys who had joined the American army. Few had even ever fought in a war. Back home, they were farmers, butchers, tailors, and shop owners. Some barely knew how to fire a gun. And their leader, General George Washington, had never led an army before. All summer, he struggled to turn his ragtag group into a trained fighting force. Remember, we talked about this at school. The Europeans had a military they had ships, they had soldiers, they had guns, they had ammo, they had all these things. America had nothing. We were the underdog. We were not supposed to win this fight. We had no clue how to have an army. General Washington had never led an army before. We were not supposed to win this war. Major attack. Joseph didn't complain about the endless marching and shooting practice. He choked down the army meals of corn, mush, wormy biscuits, and tasteless meat. Ugh. He coped with the sweltering summer heat and the stench of human waste that hung over the camp. 
Woo, stinky. Meanwhile, the British were plotting a major attack on New York. All summer long, British ships, packed with soldiers and weapons, had been streaming toward the city. British redcoat soldiers were the most feared in the world. By August, more than 32,000 redcoats were camped on Staten Island. That's just five miles south of New York City. Okay, let's stop here for a second. 20,000 men were in New York for the Americans. That's where Joseph is. Now, 32,000 redcoats just showed up, and they're five miles away. They have 12,000 more people than we do. More than 400 British ships were anchored nearby in the water, and 73 of those 400 were warships, packed with cannons that could blast apart a city block in minutes. Think about all this firepower that England has. This is like the wimpy little brother fighting Big Dad with all his toys and his guns. We're not supposed to win here, guys. This does not look good for us. Joseph could plainly see those warships lurking like caged beasts, hungry for blood and ready to strike, but he had no doubt that America would win any battle. To me, it sounds like Joseph is very sure of himself. He was wrong. At the end of August, the British attack began, and even before any shots were fired, the Americans were doomed. The British attack was brilliantly planned. Because why? They have generals. They've fought in wars before. They knew what to do, and we did not. In the pre-dawn darkness, meaning just before the sun came up and it's still dark outside, more than 15,000 soldiers began to creep toward Brooklyn, barely a mile across the river from New York City. Only a few thousand American troops were stationed there. So think of it. Two, maybe 3,000 Americans compared to 15,000 British soldiers who had the element of surprise because they're attacking early in the morning. Most were hunkered down in six American forts, roughly made buildings protected by high walls and cannons. Others were on patrol across Brooklyn. All would be caught by surprise. And over the next few days, Washington scrambled to send more men to Brooklyn. Joseph was one of them. He rode across the river. A trip. Whoop. Sorry. A trip about an hour. His pockets, sorry guys. His pockets were stuffed with hard biscuits and his heart was filled with fear. Secret escape. The moment Joseph stepped ashore, he saw a scene of horror. Wounded men lying in the grass, some with broken arms, some with broken legs, some with broken heads. He and his regiment were commanded to go to a creek. All the American troops had the same orders. Stop the British from reaching the forts. Joseph fought bravely, but the British forces were too big and too strong. Blast by fiery cannon blast, shot by crackling musket shot, the British moved down the American soldiers. Hundreds were killed, injured or taken prisoner. Those captured were doomed to almost certain death on the British prison ships docked around New York City. Thousands of men died of starvation and disease on the rat-filled, filthy floating jails throughout the war. Many Americans threw down their weapons and tried to flee, 
Oh, another vocabulary word. It means run away. Joseph watched in horror as dozens of American soldiers drowned trying to escape across a deep pond. He helped drag some of their bodies out of the water. And for the next three days, he and his regiment fought to drive away British troops and to stay alive. So here, if you look at the map before we keep going, the British were stationed here down by Staten Island. And the Americans were stationed here up in Brooklyn. So it was just a matter of coming across the harbor and surprising them. Many Ameri oh, I'm sorry. On the third day of fighting, the British closed in on the American forts. Inside the forts were thousands of terrified American soldiers and General George Washington himself. If the British captured these soldiers in the forts, the war would almost certainly be lost. America's fight for freedom would end on the blood-soaked battlefields of Brooklyn. But even in the midst of the blood and smoke and terror, Washington did not give up. He came up with a bold plan to sneak the entire American army out of Brooklyn. Sounds risky, but it sounds like it's their only option. Eight long years. An aide to General Washington managed to sneak out of Brooklyn and back to New York City. He sent out an urgent message. The American need boats in Brooklyn, now. Within hours, dozens of boats, big and small, were on the shores of Brooklyn. Under the cover of darkness and fog, thousands of American soldiers, including Joseph, were quietly ferried safely back to New York City. So here, see them here stationed in Brooklyn? The boats came across the East River and got them out of Brooklyn and into Manhattan. So as the British were coming up and around like this and attacking, the Americans were escaping this way. After dawn, the British launched their attack on the six Brooklyn forts. They were astonished to discover that the forts were empty. Ha <laughs> ha! Somehow the entire American army had slipped away and was safe in New York City. The Americans had lost the Battle of Brooklyn, but the army had survived. They would keep fighting. And fight they did. The American Revolution lasted for eight long and grueling years. Towns were burned. Families were torn apart. Thousands of soldiers were killed in battle or died of fever and disease that spread easily in the crowded and dirty army camps. Soldiers' illness spread to their families too, killing many more. Fear and suffering gripped America. In 1783, after hundreds of battles across the colonies, the war finally ended. The British had surrendered after the Battle of Yorktown in Virginia, and America had won. Joseph fought during the entire war. He moved to Maine, married, and raised five children. He died at age 89. Throughout his life, he never forgot the dangers and suffering of being a soldier, but he never lost his pride in helping America win its fight for freedom. That was really nice, guys. I had a nice time reading that with you. So here's what you're going to do for homework. Because we read this and had a discussion, we're not going to answer questions. Woohoo! But what you're going to do for homework is you're going to open up your schedule that I sent to you guys. It should look something like this. What you'll find is Tuesday, and here's our social studies lesson. We're reading Blood, Smoke, and Freedom, A True Story of the American Revolution. What you see here in the homework section is a link beyond the battlefield. I want you to take a virtual tour of what life was like in 1776. So you can click right on the link. I'm not going to because I already did. And it will bring you to... Hold on. Maybe I will click it. There we go. I survived beyond the battlefield. It's a virtual field trip. So this is Laura Tarshish. This is our author of the I Survive book. And she was also the author of our Blood, Smoke, and Freedom story. So all you have to do is click play. And you will see... 
that the virtual field trip will begin. Watch this video and we'll talk about it today when we Zoom at 6.30. Bye guys, see you tonight.